It's back. Bigger. Better. And better. It's Black's History Month, the sequel, a 28-day celebration of black exploitation films. Oh yeah, you know what time it is. It's Shaft. It's not just a name, but a promise. He's a bad man. If you try to outsmart him, you'll get the shaft. Try to fight him, you get the shaft. You act like you want to put your hands on him. Boy, what the f wrong with you? You almost got shafted. Try to get in his pants? Well, you get the shaft. Richard Roundtree is back at Shaft and Shaft's big score. And that's not the only thing that hasn't changed since both director Gordon Parks and writer Ernest Tiedemann returned for the sequel. The only thing that is different is a bigger budget, which means more action, more style, and more explosions. The only thing I wish did make a return is the music by Isaac Hayes, because the new theme just doesn't hit the same as the original. Now look here. Who twists your spine till it feel like jelly and heat your blood till it's boiling wine? Who splits your heart and is it in pieces? Shaft. Baby, you blow your mind. Mm-hmm, he sure will. They tried it, though. Isaac Hayes did do one song for the movie, but refused to do any more than that because of a payment dispute. That man won a Grammy off the first movie. You can't pay him with new record deal money, especially seeing as this movie had a $2 million budget this time around versus $500,000 the first time. Pay that man. Gordon Parks ended up doing the score himself, and it shows. It's not terrible, but it's also not as iconic as the first movie. Speaking of the first movie, last year I talked about it being a bit slow and light on action until towards the end, but oh boy, the Shaft's big score rectify that. It's not non-stop action, but it's definitely better paced throughout. The story goes like this. John Shaft gets a call from his close friend Cal Asby. I say good friend, but when Shaft gets the call, he's just got done applying the Shaft to Cal's sister, so I don't really know what to call their relationship. Regardless, Cal says he's in trouble and needs Shaft's help, and it's a good thing he had to take the time to put his clothes back on because the minute he pulls up to the building, that's the end of old Cal, but his surviving business partner John Kelly, who secretly owes the mob a bunch of money, believes that there's a stash of money somewhere in the funeral home they both own. Nobody can find it, however, so Kelly has to try to find out what happened to it while simultaneously keeping the mob, the cops, and Shaft off his ass. It's easier said than done though, because Shaft is on the case, in his face, and all in his lady's place. I like that Shaft's big score feels like a continuation of the original film. It's not completely a direct sequel, but it's got some recurring characters that makes it feel like one cohesive universe, something that a lot of these movies don't do. Like how off-brand Bumpy Johnson, aka Bumpy Jonas, returns along with his right-hand doorman who still hates Shaft. <laughs> what round did you go out in, man? You ain't pretty as you used to be. I have to commend the much improved stunt work also. The last 30 minutes is almost all action and it includes a good as hell car chase scene and some great helicopter stunts. This little maneuver through the warehouse might look basic, but look how tight it is. That takes skill. Overall, I like Shaft's big score better than the first one, even though it wasn't as well received critically. For one, the villain is way more fleshed out this time around. Although he is a little cliche and one dimensional, Shaft himself is also a much more confident character than his first go round, and his humor is funnier than the hit or miss one liners from the first film. Shaft is the prototype for pretty much all the black male tough guys of the black exploitation era, and even though some of them went on to do bigger things and better movies, it's nice to see that Shaft still holds up and carries the torch for an entire generation of copycats. 